Nga mihi and welcome to Tower Sector Report. This week we get up close and personal with Federated Farmers' new power player. It's the man who'll take the helm of the Feds for the next three years, newly elected President Bruce Wills. Find out about what makes the new president tick. Why did he leave jobs in the finance world in his early 40s to return to the family's 1,100 hectare property in Hawke's Bay's hill country? From the personal to the policy driving the new president with an inside look at the direction he hopes to lead his seven-strong board, complete with five new members. Meantime, Tower Sector Report correspondent Drew Chappell investigates how dairy farmers are gearing up for this crucial time of the year with nearly four million new cars on their way into the supply chain. Drew speaks to farmers about how the recent wet weather across the country is affecting rates of disease and newborn calves and you'll discover the latest hot tips on calf rearing from a Dairy NZ veterinary scientist. But first up, Let's get to know the new president of Federated Farmers, Bruce Wills. Well, Bruce, welcome to Tower Sector Report uh, here on Country 99 TV. Now, we've made a bit of extra time on this week's programme, so our audience can get to know a bit about Bruce Wills, the man, as he takes over the reins of Federated Farmers. I understand you were brought up on some pretty unforgiving land. Tell me about your, your early years. Sure, it was a unique uh, childhood. Uh, remembering back, it's um, we lived uh, down the ex end of a, a long no exit road. So mm -hmm. although quite close to Napier, 45 kilometres from from Napier, uh, we were off the the, the main Napier Taupo Road, uh, five and a half k's uh, windy metal road through the pine trees. Mm -hmm. uh, we were the only family down there, uh, and, and largely surrounded by trees on all sides, uh, dock uh, and, and some 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 pine trees. And pretty hilly country, I guess. Yes, it was, and, and we uh, we broke the country in. So uh, in 1956, my my father mm. and his uncle brought the property. Uh, at that stage it was carrying no stock whatsoever, wow. just 2,800 acres of, of scrub and blackberry, uh, wild pigs and oh. lots of goats. So yeah. um, it was, uh, that yeah. was a, a pretty daunting task facing them then. Yes, it was, yes, and, and certainly my father, uh, when I look back on his farming career, uh, probably 20 years at least spent uh, sitting on a bulldozer, mm. crushing scrub. 1960, we began a garden mm. uh, around a little wee cottage in the middle of this patch of scrub, as I explained, uh, and that, that garden has now grown to, to 12 hectares, so 30 acres, uh, wow. it is now a, an internationally recognised woodland garden, it uh, goes by the name of Trellano Park, mm -hmm. uh, and we've, we've hosted uh, now almost 100,000 visitors through, through Trellano Park uh, in, in the subsequent years. So uh, it's now a big part of um, the business we run and it sits right in the middle of the, of the farming business. Now, you went off to boarding school in the South sure. Island, to my school actually, That's right. Great College. School. Yep, yes, indeed. Yes. Uh, yes. And then it was after that you took off to Lincoln College mm. and then the world of finance sure. in the city. Mm. So what career did you, did you pursue? Did you go, once you'd got your degree from Lincoln, did you go straight into a bank or what? Yes, I did. Yes, uh, as, as we've touched on, it was a pretty um, uh, sort of frontier t type childhood, I mm. guess. And uh, mm. at, at 13, I left the farm and went to Nelson College, as you, as you pointed out. Um, yeah, and then, then once university, uh, before I'd finished my last exams, um, uh, an outfit no, no longer in existence, but called the Rural Bank, mm -hmm. came along and offered me a job, subject to passing my final exams. Yeah. And, and uh, for me in those days, a car came with it, plus a, a pretty attractive salary. So mm. uh, I, I said yes to that. Um, and subsequently spent much of the next 20 years in banking following right. that, uh, th those first three years with Rural Bank. And I think I picked up a little bit in insurance? Uh, well. invest AMP, was, mm. uh, I was three years with Rural Bank, mm -hmm. uh, got my values registration and my farm management uh, registration and then moved to AMP Investments in Wellington. Right. Uh, just some months before the, the world fell, fell to bits in 1987. Yeah. So uh, I was involved with, with various uh, aspects tidying up, I guess, uh, AMP's involvement with, with some of its uh, less successful ventures in, right. in those late 80s. Mm. Um, and then, but but yeah, m most of the time, 17 years in total with AMP right. on, on the lending side largely. Yeah. And all that time, mainly rurally based business that you were concentrating on? Specifically, uh, I also um, I moved to Hamilton. Uh, it was Wellington initially and then Auckland uh, and then Hamilton where I, I managed the AMP office. So we had a fair number of staff there uh, and looked after all our lending operations, mm -hmm. which were a combination of house, commercial and rural. But um, always uh, had, had an affinity with the rural book and, and, and stuck pretty closely to that. Right. Which would have given you wonderful insights into yes, how did. farms operate as businesses mm. and which would suit you well in your current role. Absolutely. How, how long ago did you move back to the family farm? I think seven years, was it? Yes, 2003. We. Right. Um, uh, AMP, we sold our 
lending operations to various banks and mm. it was an opportunity for me to, to look at something different. Uh, so I, um, I tossed and turned for, for, for some months but uh, it was, at that stage there was a, an opportunity to go back to the home farm and mm. I thought um, I think I was early 40s in those days and before I got too too long in the tooth, time mm -hmm. to go back and uh, give give this farming game a go. So um, yeah, it's been seven years now and uh, certainly haven't regretted it at all. How did the prop ownership of the property break down? You had four brothers, sure. are, are any of them still involved in Tananai? Uh, it, it is a family property, so we all have some involvement, but uh, but m my brother Scott and I r now run the place in partnership, so um, uh, that uh, that works well and it, it does allow me to do what I'm doing today, uh, and that uh, I've got people running the, the, the show while I'm not there, so um, it's, yeah. it's a good system. Well, it's going to be a, a challenge for managing your time, though, mm -hmm. isn't it, Bruce? I mean, the, the presidency is going to put a big hole in the time you can spend on the farm, I'd have thought. Yes, it is. Uh, and to be honest, I'm still feeling my way. I, um, I, I did, uh, when I stood for this position, make it very clear to, to uh, the National Council that I was, <coughs> being, being a new farmer, seven years uh, into it, the, the, the fire on my belly for farming is, is, is still burning pretty strongly. Mm. So I, I still uh, got a team of dogs uh, and still intend to farm. But it's probably going to be more weekends, I imagine, than, yes. uh, than, than midweek. So um, you, I'll have to work on that balance. Yeah, you'll, you'll get that uh, sometimes scathing description from farmers of, oh, he's just a hockey yes. farmer. <laughs> <laughs> yes, but, but uh, oh no, no, I've still got very much a place there. And, mm. and uh, I look, uh, when uh, we're working well, there's three of us on the farm, but mm. certainly the environmental side is something that, that I take uh, ownership of. So that's, you know, those 15 odd thousand trees plus the 300 hectares of. Um, of uh, reserve that, I, that we mm. just talked about. They take a fair bit of time and, and effort. So that's, but there are that's the stock job. as well. How many head are you yes, running? There are. The sheep and uh, beef, isn't it? Yes, we run about 8,500, 9,000 stock units. Mm -hmm. uh, pretty evenly split between cattle and sheep. Mm -hmm. So um, it's now a fattening business. We, we, we were, we, we were a store, but uh, the three droughts in, uh, for us in 07, 08, 09 turned our farming operation uh, on its head, really. Really? So we've, we've changed quite a, quite a bit. So mm -hmm. um, now, and we were six and a half thousand ewes, we're now down to two and a half thousand, but rather than taking those lambs through to, to store, right. we now take them through to, um, in fact we've only just sold some in the last week, so we take right. them right through to um, a big heavy weight, 20 kilos plus uh, late in the season, so that seems to work for us. Yeah, I mean you'll be fine tuning the sheep side of the operation yes. with the wool prices being as they are, and, yes. and, and lamb prices. Sure. Um, yes, it's sort of, uh, it's great to see, it's, um, you know, I, I was the, um, I guess the campaign uh, lead person with our T150 uh, uh, project that, that, that was done in, in, in my meat and fibre days and it was uh, satisfying to me that um, mm. my last two unit loads of lambs that went out, uh, the, uh, it was $158 average for one, 162 for the other. So wow. that's something that we, we wouldn't have imagined uh, mm. just, just a couple of years ago. Absolutely. So, We'll be back with Bruce later in the show to hear what direction Federated Farmers will take under his stewardship. But next up, our report from correspondent Drew Chappell on a crucial time of the year for dairying, the calving season. They may not look like much, but these young, quite awkward animals will one day be the backbone of our economy. Our dairy herd is now more numerous than people in this country and is growing larger by the year. Nearly 4 million dairy calves will be born here over the next few weeks and all of them will need food, shelter and healthcare if they are going to survive. And that's important because their survival is very much our economy's survival, such as the stake we've taken in dairy over the last 30 years. This one only just came in this morning. <coughs> Terry Holmes and his wife Carol farm 700 dairy cattle on their Matamata block, helped by their two sons. Calving time has just started here, just 50 calves have so far been born and the process of supplying the nutrients they need to boost their immune system has begun. Just in case they haven't drunk off the cow, so regardless they get two litres and then we know everything's right, basically sets them up for their life then. 
those first few days of life are vital for ensuring calves grow up to become strong and productive members of our dairy herd. In order to successfully navigate them through to that point, farmers need to be equal parts caregiver, wet nurse and veterinarian. No easy task. Dairy and Z scientist and vet Dr Gwyn Kirk has been involved with dairy cattle her whole life. She says since humans are effectively trying to speed up the natural growth process and get calves to a productive state as quickly as possible, it puts more onus on them to get things right. The responsibility for the people um, is, is higher. Um, they have to be providing really fully for the needs of all those calves. Um, so that is, if we go back to the basic fundamentals of the five freedoms, it includes you know, shelter, uh, food and water, management of disease, um, the whole spectrum needs to be provided because the calves are not with their mothers. Dr Verkirk says the most important part of a calf's development is the first few golden hours of life, where farmers need to ensure they get what they need. On the first day of life, I suppose, uh, what are farmers' priorities? Um, young ruminants, uh, sheep, lambs, sh lambs, calves, goats are all born with their immune system only partly developed and it's of critical importance that they get colostrum and we talk about gold colostrum which is the milk, the very first milk. Um, gold colostrum is very high in antibodies and the calf needs those antibodies to get its immune system up and running. Getting that immediate dose of colostrum is the key message Dairy and Z is trying to get out to farmers. Trying to achieve at least 6% of the calf's body weight within six hours of birth and another 6% over the next six hours. Works pretty quick. <laughs> A tough job at the best of times, but then again, so far this winter, New Zealand hasn't had the best of times. Most of the country has received its fair share of rain over the last couple of weeks and in what is the busiest time of year for most farmers, it makes the already difficult task of calving even tougher. With all that water comes mud and with mud the risk of infection. Dr Verkirk says conditions in the middle of our winter make it even more important to check for signs of disease such as pneumonia, calf scours and navel infection. And of course the weather has, uh, it plays a big part as well, it hasn't exactly been kind to farmers here. When the weather is quite cold and wet like it is at the moment, you might have a calf that's a bit hypothermic, a bit slow to get going, um, and so those calves will need extra help uh, simply to meet that requirement for colostrum within 6 to 12 hours. Terry and Carol are old hands at the calf rearing game, but every year is different. We're just starting, um, the oldest here is about four or five days, the youngest was brought in this morning. Yep. And we'll rear about 200 all told in about four different sheds. So and you're just sort of in the, in the We're stage. just starting, yeah. Yep. yeah. We calf 700 cows, I think we've got 50 or 60 in, so we're just starting, yeah. Carol and me look after the calves and we've got two sons that run the um, dairy side of it. That They and staff milk the cows and look after them. And yep. Yep. We do the calves and look after the runoffs, so yep. that's pretty much it. Terry says they've got to keep a sharp eye out for any sign of weakness in the calves right from day one. For ill thrift, got their head down, hollow, um, just moping around basically, or sitting down, not wanting to get up. So um, that, that's pretty much it. Uh, yeah. Navel infection and um, probably pneumonia are the two big ones at the moment. You'll hear them croaking to know that something's not quite right with the lungs, so you do something about that. Dr Verkirk says the vast majority of experienced farmers won't need veterinary assistance, but it helps to have a good relationship with your local vet, just in case. She says there have been some problems with new people coming into the industry with little to no experience, but overall we do a pretty good job. Overall I think we are pretty good. Um, probably our biggest challenge is getting sufficient colostrum into calves that still remains the kind of the one number one thing um, but when I look at how calf rearing systems have changed over the last 10 to 15 years um, they're certainly more efficient more professional um, and there's some very very good calf rearers out there that that really know their jobs well
So the next generation of economic powerhouses seem to be in safe hands, just like the last generation and the one before that. And for all the technological advances in modern farming, in which New Zealand leads the world, rearing calves seems to be one of the only things still done the old-fashioned way. Calving is still very much one-on-one -on -one between the stock person and the cow and the calf. Um, it's, I don't think that that will ever change. You know, we as farmers, we say animal husbandry is a bit of an old-fashioned con concept, but animal husbandry is alive and well. And uh, that relationship between farmer and animals is, is very important and it is nowhere more important than where we have these um, newborn animals that need that special care. Welcome back. New Federated Farmers President Bruce Wills is passionate about the direction he sees the organisation taking under his leadership. Buckle up and prepare for some changes. Well, Bruce, you've only been a member of the Feds for six years and rocketed up to chair the meat and fibre section after only three. Why did you decide on such a high profile role in farming politics? Listen, to be completely honest, uh, I, I think it was a case of being in the wrong place at the wrong, the wrong time. time. Uh, uh -huh. it was, I've always been happy to step up, uh, and, and certainly uh, I know the first uh, Meat and Fibre uh, Delegates uh, conference I went to, uh, it was a case of um, they were short of one person, and uh, we had a discussion between three of us on the east coast of the North Island. Mm -hmm. We felt it was important to have somebody from, from that area represented. So it, it really started from there, uh, and I think uh, subsequent to that, it, it really was. It's just something that I... Um, have found that uh, you know people do respect uh, some of my commentary. Uh, I, I, I do uh, enjoy stepping up and being involved with with industry politics. Mm -hmm. So um, uh, largely put there by other people, I think. So um, uh, you know, dare I say it, it wasn't hugely planned from from my part. Yeah. So it, it sounds like you sort of put your hand up for a right. role and then yes. suddenly thought, actually, I'm quite glad I did. I'm yes. quite enjoying sure. this. Yeah. Why happened? Absolutely. Now, traditionally, federated farmers office holders are lifelong farmers. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, and you've been a city slicker, That's really, right. for most of your adult mm -hmm. life. Did you encounter a bit of opposition to that, a bit of suspicion from these, these um, mm -hmm. traditional farmers? Interesting. It was interesting. I, um, when I put my name on the hat to, uh, to stand for this, this job, uh, I, I just thought, I guess as, as I normally try and do, to be open and honest, so mm. I very clearly said to them that um, I'd spent more time uh, living in urban than I had in rural, uh, that I'd spent more time in banking than farming, uh, and, 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 but it had a resonance, I think, with, uh, with, with the membership and with the council that, that made the call. And mm. uh, I, I think, no, to answer the question, um, it actually helped. People, uh, I think, respected particularly my banking experience Right. my commercial analysis uh, and they were looking for something uh, a little bit different and um, I guess the, the nod came my way so uh, yeah. it, it, uh, it must have been a positive. Yeah, if, the, if there were any suspicions they, sure. they certainly appear to have evaporated mm -hmm. because you, you got in with a pretty healthy vote, didn't you? It's rather a, a it's complicated a <laughs> yes, it is. voting process sure. I gather from mm -hmm. how many delegates and what did you end up with as a percentage yes. of the vote? Yes, well there's four of us of course standing mm -hmm. uh, and, and 39 were the final number of votes. Mm -hmm. um, and, and we go through a system where, where to get through to the president's position, you've got to get 50% uh, or more of the right. vote. So it's an so elimination yes process. Yes, it is. Mm -hmm. Yes. So I got through on the second second round, which did right. tell me that uh, there was a fair, fair, bit, fair bit of support, support. out there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, you've made some play in your intentions of bridging the gap between mm -hmm. urban and rural New Zealand. What's your reading of the relationship mm -hmm. between town and country? And, and how do you intend to approach it? Yeah, this is something that's um, pretty close to my heart, and, and you know, perhaps it's because I've spent half my life in urban, half my mm. coming up half my life in rural. Um, I don't think there's a divide, and I'm pretty uh, staunch on that one. What, mm. what I think is that uh, there, there's, a, there's some understanding from both sides that needs to be built on and, and, and worked on. Mm. Uh, and I think I come from a view that, that New Zealand is all about agriculture. Uh, it is our competitive advantage, uh, and, and, and the farming community know it, and, and I think most of the urban population do as well. Mm. But it's about telling a story that, that we're not going to succeed as an agricultural nation until we, unless we have all of us on the same page mm. about understanding the importance of agriculture to New Zealand. Now there are five new members on the yes. seven person board so that's mm. a lot of new faces. Yes, yes it is. C can you see this fresh new board changing the way Federated Farmers goes about its job? 
Listen, I think it's inevitable, uh, but mm. but only in so far that um, five new people, as you say, from the sort of backgrounds that that uh, people are. By the way, are they a bit younger than the previous incumbents? Uh, they probably are. are. They? Yeah, so probably it's a are. bit of a generational change it, it, too. It, it is. Yes, it is. And I think um, new people. There'll be new personalities, new style, new approach. But but I, I have been quick to add that the you know the issues will be largely the same. Uh, issues three weeks ago before I took the role mm. are the same as they are today, but it's it's a different uh, different group of people handling mm. them. And, and it will be a different approach. Um, so, what sort of emphases do you do you see them putting on on different aspects of the industry? I think it'll be a, a, a broader a, a broader approach because of the backgrounds that these where these people come mm. from. And as you're well aware, it's uh, you know not only have we've got at long last some good gen gender balance, but we've mm. got uh, an American investment banker, we've got a, a biotechnologist, we've got a uh, a Dutch immigrant who's uh, been a very successful dairy farmer. So yeah. it's just a real breadth. So really, yeah, it's a big spread of, of background, isn't it? It is, and I think mm. my hope is that that will bring some some very broad-minded discussion to the issues. Yeah. Uh, and, and I, you know, we are an advocacy body, and, mm. and I think people that we advocate with uh, will, will listen, I hope, uh, more intensely to, to, to our, our commentary and our debate because mm. of that um, interesting a group of directors that we now have. You will be putting a greater emphasis on sustainable farming and, and the environment in your advocacy, do you think, in the next Yes, I will. Yeah, listen, I'm happy to be up front on that one because it's one where I, I think uh, most farmers are doing good stuff, uh, mm. and I would say uh, you know 90 percent plus are, are making a real effort with their environmental responsibility. Uh, probably my disappointment is that that's not being recognised enough. Mm. But I am conscious that there is some areas around the fringes where perhaps uh, we're not front, we farmers are not front footing the environmental responsibility mm. the way we should be, mm. uh, and I think that um, that has built friction and tension between various groups. <coughs> I'm keen to to make certain we uh, have a free and frank conversation with 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 those groups that hold concerns. And, mm. and come to some sort of agreement where we, we can find some good middle ground. Yeah. Uh, and I think, you know, I hasten to add that the important thing for us is that, and I use the words uh, sustainable profitability quite a bit because, uh, mm. you know, my members... Uh, yeah, you've still course, got to make a buck on the way through. The economics you? is very important, yeah. very important, and, mm. and, and we largely use the environment to, to, to run our businesses. We mm. use the water, the, the sunshine, the grass, the, the landscape. But... That needs to be understood very clearly by, by uh, you know, all parties concerned. Mm. But uh, as I say, with the, the, the sustainable profitability, that profitability is only going to be sustainable mm. if we do it with a long-term vision as, as to how we treat those resources, mm. the water, the landscape, the, uh, the grass that we use. So um, it's, yeah, it, it's, a, it's a, uh, an approach where both sides are important and we've mm. just got to get the balance, uh, balance right. Absolutely. And I, I guess just because of the nature of it, dairying will be the main focus of attention when you're looking at sustainable practices. Listen, dairying's more visible. It's nearer the main yeah. centres, and and, and, and uh, it's on the, it's on, the, on the on those areas where uh, mm. yeah, a lot of the urban population see what's yeah, going exactly. on. And mm. in short, it's been the growth industry. So we need to um, we need to front up, and and if there's concerns, we need to talk that through. And, and again, coming back to you know, my point I made, it's just those dairy farmers have an absolute right to, to run a profitable business. But I also believe that the urban population, uh, the rural towns, have an absolute right to expect care and a consideration yeah. of the landscape and the Indeed. water and the like. So we, we'll, we'll get that to, we'll work on that balance. Now just finally and very briefly on, on the environment, where do you stand on climate change and the ETS? Are you a, a climate change proponent or a denier? Mm -hmm. Your predecessor was, was sure. a denier. Sure. Listen, I, 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 I listen to both sides of the argument and, and I find both sides, uh, if, if they're well to told, mm. quite compelling. So I'm, I, I'm, I'm neither, to answer your question. Uh, I, I guess I'm not a scientist and, and mm. I think it's probably safer for me to steer clear of that debate. Mm. And what I do know is that farmers rely on the environment uh, every day uh, for, for, for our business and our decision making. And, and, and we've just got to, as, as farmers do, listen to the signals that uh, the weather sends us mm. and, and, and adjust accordingly, uh, as we have for many years. So, yeah, it's a big issue, the one. Uh, climate change, ETS, it'll be something that um, that uh, this won't be the last time that uh, I'll be talking about that, I'm certain. I'm sure it won't be, yeah. I mean, presumably your instincts are no, farming should not be in the ETS. Would that be a fair summary? Yes, listen, we, well, we are of course in the ETS and so far that farmers, uh, like every other New Zealander mm. since the 1st of July 2010, we're paying uh, ETS uh, surcharges on, on fuel and on mm. energy. It's the biological emissions which yes, are the hard exactly. bit. Um, and certainly my view is that um, 
if our animals are adding to, to global warming, we have to consider consider that. But um, we, we need to get the science sorted out uh, because at, at this stage, we, we have no mitigation uh, that, that we can place against our, our, our ruminant animals. So. Um, a lot, lot of work to be done in that space. Yes, well, I'm sure that's not the last time we'll hear from you talking about the ETS. Well, fascinating interview, Bruce, and I think it's, uh, it's given our viewers a good idea of just what makes Bruce Wills tick. So, new Feds President Bruce Wills there. And that's our sector report for this week. Remember, you can catch the show on our website. Ka kite ya.